Hello, everyone, and welcome to Into the Terminal. Uh, today, we're going to learn about some Linux performance and using eBPF, which is the extended Berkeley packet filter, with a set of utilities called the BCC tools. Hey, I'm Nate. looking forward to learning something today, Scott, because uh, I'm going to be honest, right? I've used I've used these tools in my TAM days, but it was mainly at the <laughs> at the at, at the supervision of our support folks, and they just kind of gave me a script and said, "Have the customer run this." <laughs> so I'm going to learn something today. <laughs> right on. Well, let's just jump into the terminal and we'll get going. All right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to install the BCC tools. So we're going to do a DNF. I'm just going to answer yes to all the questions. What could go wrong? And we're going to install, I know, BCC tools. And so this will pull in all the dependencies that I need uh, to run it. And uh, it's going to give me a collection of applications that I can use for getting data about this machine. Um, I've already taken the liberty of installing Tmux, and I'm going to actually use Tmux to split the screen a bit so we can see a couple different things in parallel, which is super fancy. Fancy, um, fancy. Yep. And then, and then we'll actually do some examples of the tools. So just a minute while we finish the install. You know, Scott, somebody once told me that installing packages shouldn't be part of your demo unless it's actually relevant to the demo. So so I thought it was relevant <laughs> to the demo because like, how do we run these tools because they're not natively installed on your machine, right? Um, and right. in fact- I guess that's true. Right. They also get installed in a weird place. So that's something else that we're gonna take a look at because like, how, how do we know what they are, right? So for example, I know that there's one called XFS Slower but tab completion won't work. And the reason that tab completion won't work is because if we look at the list of files that were provided by the BCC tools RPM, the tools themselves are put down to user share BCC tools, which is not a directory on my path. So there's which a couple of things. We talked about last can... week. Path. We could. So, so we could adjust the path, but then I have to like re-log in and re-log out or actually log out then log back in to get it uh, updated or set it in every shell. Um, instead, I'm just going to use the fully qualified file name to get to the tool that I want. All right, so that's something to be aware of. I think it's stored in this weird place that's not on the uh, root user or regular user's path environment variable. So let me get my screen set up the way I want. Uh, thank you to the magic of Tmux. There we go. So I now have three yeah. shells. Yeah. And so we're going to, I'm going to run a couple of tools here. Um, so in this one, I'm going to use um, cache top. Oh, see, not in the path. Yeah. You just told me that it's not in the path, Scott. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to run cache top. And so this is like the top utility but for cache on the system, right? So we could see the process ID, the user ID that was running that process, the actual command for that process. And then we get hits and misses and a couple other things that are off the screen because I have my font larger so we can actually read it. Um, so let's go over here. And over here, I'm going to run XFS slower uh, with full path. path. <laughs> maybe you should just add it to your path scott maybe i should all right uh so here what we're looking at are uh those xfs file system operations right so um the file system format used on red hat enterprise linux is called xfs so we're looking at those xfs file system transactions that are taking longer than 10 milliseconds to resolve. And so we'll get the time, the command, the process ID, the size uh, and latency and some other stuff um, along with the file name. All right, and actually to make it a little bit more readable, let me see if I shrink my term a little bit. There we go, that's a little bit better. Um, and then up in the top window, 
I'm going to run a utility uh, that we can then see as it hits these other utilities um, with data. So the point of BCC tools is to provide you performance observability, right? You can look at a certain type of transaction that you're interested in and get more information on it. And so I'm just going to do a DNF update on glibc cockpit and core utils. There we go. All right, so when we're looking at a DNF update, <clears throat> the reason that we are going to see these two commands doing stuff is that we're downloading a RPM, an updated RPM, and then we're going to be taking the files out of that RPM archive and placing it around the directory structure, which is going to be doing those file system transactions. And then also, we should see the DNF utility doing things with cache on the system, right? So both file cache, um, actually, that's what we're looking at is file cache. So we should be able to see some cache information as well. So let me go ahead and get this running. <clears throat> All right, so uh, what we're seeing is, whoop, my cache top died. There's a little path name there. Um, so what we're seeing is uh, over on the left side that XFS operation slower than 10 milliseconds. Interesting. I bet it's because I changed the size of the window. <laughs> um, but we're seeing like Funny the DNF utility is right uh, is working with things like cockpit files. Uh, it's working with RPM SQL Lite database. It's doing some stuff with libaudit as it's running uh, scripts um, as it's installing the updates. All right, let's, uh, instead of using cache top, let's do... What if you do a reset cache. in that terminal that might reset yeah, the geometry and whatnot, cool. and then try your tool again, see what happens. Dun, 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 dun. No, it doesn't work at all. There we go. <laughs> all right, so that seems a little better. All right. Um, so we're actually watching like the actual real time file cache hits and misses occur on this machine using cache top. Um, there are other tools too. So, for example, and let me control C out of cache top here. I'm going to run a run called CPU dist. We finally fixed cache top, and now you're not going to use it anymore. Man. I know. Um, <laughs> we got a lot to do today, Nate. We don't have time for cache top all day. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is another type of BCC utility. Um, and what it's doing is it's looking over the entire system, and it's figuring out how long different processes are spending on the CPU of the system. And then it's going to plot on a distribution diagram how long things take. And what we'll be able to see is kind of overall in the system, are things resolving quickly in you know, a couple milliseconds or are things taking longer to resolve and getting to the 10, 20, hundreds of milliseconds on average uh, before they're completed. Uh, so I've collected some data. Let me hit Control C and it will show me the... Oh, Histogram that's very small. Let me try it again in another terminal. Control C. Let's try this one more time. User share BCC tools CPU dist. Let's collect that data one more time and, and then maybe we can see it in a larger terminal rather than that little segment that I was working in. Nate, it'll interest you to know that I actually tested all of this yesterday, uh, but it was when I used the default font size in all the terminals. Oh, so it's the live stream's fault. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So when I hit Control C, this is the distribution diagram. They actually call it a histogram. 
And so the uh, first column is usex, which are milliseconds. The second column is count, right? These are the number of processes that finished their processor usage. And then the distribution is just kind of a graphic of like where, where things ended up in terms of uh, how often a process was in this category or not. So what we can see is that the majority of our processes are finishing in eight to 15 usex by a lot. Right, 784 of them. And then a smaller group, 219 of them finished in four to seven USEX. And then 93 of them finished in the two to three. 118 of them finished in the 64 to 127 category of USEX. Um, and so where this is or why this might be interesting is um, if you're having things like your web services are getting weird timeouts, as an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of web servers, when they kick off a process to serve something that's uh, programmatic, right, like a CGI script or a Python application, um, it'll wait a certain amount of time for that application to finish and come back with the data so that it can then serve it out to the client that requested it. Right. But a lot of those web server applications have a timeout built into them. So if your application thing takes longer than 30 seconds to resolve the request, your web server thing will kill off that uh, application yeah. and then give the user like a weird error about broken pipe or something not responding. Well, obviously that um, means you set the timeout too low. Uh, which is not always <laughs> something configurable. Um, so what, what we can do is, is we're, it was use this type of tool as a troubleshooting and diagnosis utility to help us say, oh, look at all these processes that are taking so long to resolve. And then we start digging into why are these things taking so long to resolve? Uh, what I'm showing here on my normal CPU disk is normal, right? I expect things to be more towards the very short time right. to resolve. Um, it's more like if there's more stuff down in the, you know, one and two seconds or even longer to resolve that I would start to be concerned. So a question that cropped up in my head and also cropped up in chat is, can we see what those processes were? Or are you going to maybe go into that later? Uh, so I was not planning on going more into that. However, um, there are other utilities that can tell you longer running processes. And then it turns out that CPU dist can actually attach to a process. So you can uh, look at each time it comes onto the CPU. What does it look like when it runs there? So... Uh, CPU disk dash P and a process ID will tell you uh, or will attach this utility for counting CPU utilization to a single process. So if you have other reasons to suspect a certain process is the problem, then you can use this to inspect that process. So that makes sense. Indeed. And, and in fact, um, we, were, we have a lab on it where we attach it to uh, an MS SQL application. Um, and we changed some settings in the MS SQL backend for how the database itself um, handles stuff. And then we run this again attached to the MS SQL process and we see how the changes we made to the MS SQL configuration adjusted um, how our distribution of CPU time worked. But Scott, where can people find those labs? Oh, well, that's uh, <laughs> lab.redhat.com. <laughs> All right. So we are uh, well past our transition. So we're, stay with us as we get into more BCC tools. We'll talk about what they are and how they work. Um, also, don't forget to mash that like and subscribe button so that you can tell us, hey, I like this content. Keep making it. Uh, I know this is a little bit deeper than what we normally do, but I'm a big uh, kernel nerd. And so Nate was out of town and I got to be myself. So Somebody uh, lets Scott no one, have control. <laughs> that's right. Never a good idea. <laughs> All right, so stay with us, everybody. We'll see you. Oh, hey, Nate. How's it going, Scott? <laughs> what what time is it anyway? I just spent all week on the other side of the country, and now I'm like, it's it's weird. I feel like I'm, I'm not sure if it's noon or if it's, what, 9 a.m. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, just imagine what our West Coast friends feel like. Uh, that yeah, right. Well, people elsewhere in the globe, they have no idea what time it is for us.
Is it is it time to eat lunch or is it time to eat breakfast? I, I can't tell. <laughs> all right. Oh, uh, all right. <laughs> BCC tools. So let's jump back into the terminal and we will take a look at them. So first off, like what what are these things? So I said earlier yeah. that they're all down in this uh, user share BCC tools directory. And so here's a bunch of tools. And if we do a file on one of them, like um, Biotop, it is an, a Python script. And so this uses the BPF trace um, technology that comes with the distribution. And we actually write these Python scripts to like grab certain data and do the data formatting for the output and handle doing things like the control seed and know that we should stop collecting data. So we use Python as basically our application layer for interacting with the extended Berkeley packet filter or eBPF um, infrastructure built into the kernel to then go and start collecting data. And then when we're finished collecting data, organize and display it so that someone can make sense out of it. Right. So these are hooks that are built into the kernel that allow you to pull certain information out of the kernel, the running kernel, which is pretty powerful, right? I mean, there's well, the... Go ahead. I was going to say, I'll go a step further and make it even more crazy. So there's actually... Did you, did you know, Nate, that your kernel has a kernel? I heard you like kernel. I, I heard you like kernels, so I put a kernel in your kernel. <laughs> exactly. I almost said uh, containers so, because that's the that's the joke. <laughs> so built into the Red Hat Enterprise Linux kernel uh, is an eBPF kernel, and so it's a virtual machine actually running inside of our Linux kernel. Now, what's cool about that is because it's built with the kernel. It has all that live access to data that we were talking about. Right. But what's also cool is we can monkey around with it and like get data out of it without interfering with our running system. And so some of right. the other technologies that we have for getting data out of our kernel, like, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on it. It's a system tap. System tap yeah. has you compile modules and insert it into your kernel to do similar stuff to capture data and report on it. But by doing that, you're actually like modifying the kernel that's running your machine. Uh, you also have to do things like carry a C compiler um, for the machine that you want to compile these modules and insert it onto. So the packages that run system uh, tap are a little bit larger in their requirements. And that means in like a production environment where you want to minimize what software you have to maintain over time, it's a little bit more challenging. So uh, we're using this kernel within the kernel to interrogate to get all this live data. Yeah, the use case that I can recall having dealt with this, like I said in the beginning with, uh, with our support folks was uh, we were troubleshooting a network problem and it was just really tricky. We couldn't figure out exactly where uh, packets were getting dropped, I think it was. So we were actually able to follow a network packet as it went through the stack because we were able to talk to the kernel, which was pretty cool, right? Yeah. I don't know how they did it. It was magic, wizardry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, any, apparently possible. <laughs> yeah, any technology uh, not fully understood is interchangeable with magic, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so right, we've so we sidetracked enough, but good information. <laughs> so bring the terminal back up, and I want to call your attention to some of these... Uh, some of these applications, right? You'll notice that there's some names that all kind of start or end the same. Uh, so exa for example, uh, in the first column, there's a bunch of bio something. And that's I'm actually- a little concerned block. about the one that says kill Snoop. Yeah. What did Snoop uh, so do to you? Bio is block IO. So you can look at the actual block IO operations that are happening on your machine. Uh, we saw cache top, and uh, that's for file cache. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one where you'll notice that if you look across the list of commands, there's a bunch of tops. So cache mm -hmm. top, file top. File top. Um, yeah, there's another one in here. Oh, TCP top. So the tops are basically 
like the top application we use for managing processes or looking at the most um, resource intensive processes, but they apply to this specific subsystem of our system, like block IO or file interactions or cache, uh, file cache interactions. All right, over on the second column, um, CPU dist we saw, there's a bunch of, there's a couple of DBs. Guess what those work with, Nate? Um, some manner of database. There you go. Or decibels, um, perhaps. Is it, does it make noise? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's de databases. Yeah. Um, I was working with XFS slower in the critical path, but you'll notice in the third column, there's an EXT4 slower. So it's not just XFS. You can also look at EXT4 formatted file systems. Um, funk, talking about function calls. So function call counts, intervals, latency. Um, Java, so you can actually trace Java applications using the Java utilities. And you'll notice there's others for different programming languages too. So there's PHP, uh, there's um, Ruby, Perl, I'm sorry, um, and Python Perl? ones. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yay. Uh, there's the language TCP that will never stuff. die. TCP stuff. So there's a whole bunch of things on networking. And and Nate, that's probably what you guys were using when you were trying to trace that packet through yeah. uh, the kernel. Um, so looking at some of the, not just the front part of the name, but the back part of the name. So we talked about tops. There's also snoops. So snoops are ones that will report when an activity happens. So kill snoop right. is tell me when the kill signal is used or sync snoop, tell me when the sync command or the sync function is used for flushing all the uh, buffered disk IO to the disk. Um, so snoops are, this specific activity is happening, tell me about it. Um, stat, give me the status of something. There's a couple of disks that give you the distribution either across the system or across a specific uh, process, um, count a number of things. And uh, there's a couple that are lat or latency. So that tells you how long something takes. Uh, so those there's are the a, kinds of things that you here. see. Yeah, there, there is. There's like um, just about 100, maybe a little bit over 100 different utilities to use. All right. So um, some, you want to try some out? Sure. All right. I'm curious so what that, me... that that the one up in there that looks like a, a C source file. Is that like, are you expected to compile that yourself? <laughs> uh, hold on. The deadlock C? Uh, there's a couple of them, actually. Deadlock C and netqtop.c. Hmm. Oh, I see. There's I a netqtop right above it. So I guess that's already there. Maybe that's... So you can tweak it if needed. Don't know. We're not going off script on demos though, Nate, because that's how we get into trouble. <laughs> you mean diving into recompiling C code on stream isn't a good idea? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? What could All go right. wrong? Uh, so I'm going to do user share BCC tools, um, sync snoop. All right, so I said that snoops look for a specific activity to happen mm -hmm. on the machine. Um, and you had said kill snoop. Um, that's the kill uh, the process gets the killed. Kill signal right. being sent. Um, but this is for syncs. So what you'll see is if I go up one window and I run the sync command, it's correctly spelled. Right. It says, hey, I was monitoring it this many seconds uh, of my monitoring, the thing was made. And when I do and it that's again, like oh, when it disk cache again. and disk get synchronized, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, but so running the sync command and seeing it show up in sync snoop is kind of lame, right? Because you know I'm running the thing, so I expect it to show up there. But I mean, you if you really want to know when it happens. <laughs> but there's a whole bunch of other stuff, like if we were doing NFS-based stuff, or uh, if right. we had 
like a bunch of file IO applications, um, or we had a bunch of applications running that were doing file moving um, and we were having problems with it. Sync is important because it actually like stops what we're doing on the machine and immediately flushes all the queued up disk writes and stuff out to disk. So it can impact the performance of your machine because you're basically interrupting what's happening and saying, no, 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 this is the most important thing right now. Right. Um, and so if an application is doing that, it could cause problems with other applications and you wouldn't know unless you actually ran some of these utilities to kind of see what's happening to know that that's what's happening on the machine and why like all of a sudden things slow way down. Well, it's because everything's being redirected over to this other um, resource. Uh, so once you observe the behavior, now you can start to go into other utilities like, um, I don't know, uh, top and see what's going on or maybe S trace to attach it to the process and see what function calls are being called by that application to see how frequently right. it's hitting the F-Sync um, system call or something like that. Now this gives us the time, I guess that's the time it took to run it or that is that like a system time? It doesn't tell us what process uh, did it. Correct, it does not tell us what process did it um, because Sync Snoop is basically saying on the entire machine, notify me when this specific thing happens. Right. So um, it, it's not as uh, complex, but remember that this is sync snoop is a Python program. So maybe that data is there. We're just not exposing it in the output of sync snoop. Right. So you can also make your own customizations to, or your own custom versions of these applications if you want to get really into it. Um, Another one I think is kind of neat. User share BCC tools, hard IQ, IRQs. Uh, so Nate, what's a what's an IRQ? That's a interrupt request, right? So, my gosh, you're taking me way back to like college years when I learned about how IRQs work. This is when when things need to make hardware calls generally, right? You need to interrupt the uh, the processor and say, "Hey, make me let me do a thing." Yeah, and so like when you're receiving network traffic, the network mm -hmm. adapter will send an IRQ that says, hey, Colonel, you need to collect the packets off of my my device. Um, mm -hmm. Here, when I hit Control-C and actually report it out, we're seeing a bunch of vert IO, right? So this is um, a virtual machine. And so we're seeing network traffic going in and out of the uh, virtual machine. We're also seeing disk IO going in and out of the virtual machine. So um, you know, you're able to see kind of when the hardware on your machine is requiring CPU and attention. And this can also identify kind of like where busy areas might be on your machine. Eric right. says I get 10 then, points for knowing what an IRQ was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Biotop is the last one I'm gonna show you as we're coming up on time. Uh, so this is a top, right? So it's going to refresh periodically and it's showing us uh, what the biggest amounts of block IO users are on the system. So if I use DD to like make a block IO thing, um, it should show up somewhere. So it did a thing. Oh, we saw K K worker like was crunching out a bunch of stuff as it was uh, pulling data in and out and making this big file. Big file. Right. So it's going in and doing stuff uh, to control block IO. All right. So how does all this work? I mentioned that your kernel has a kernel called uh, EBPF. So yo, if you're interested kernel has a in kernel, more, yo. that's right. If you're interested <laughs> in more, uh, there is a EBPF project uh, called EBPF.io. Um, we actually wrote a blog, Red Hat wrote a blog about EBPF and wrapping it with the BCC tools and kind of how that works. 
Uh, so that was published uh, late last year and is pretty interesting if you want to like get more into that uh, Python application. How do we actually wrap this or interact with this embedded kernel? And then the last thing that I'm going to throw out there is uh, there's an official Red Hat doc that is in the uh, managing, monitoring, and updating your kernel doc. Because really what BCC tools are is um, observability utilities. So there's a problem. We don't necessarily know what the problem is. You're only seeing the behavior, right? System slow, networking's not working the way you expect. And so the way that you start to dig into that is to try and figure out what's happening on the machine so that you can better um, direct your troubleshooting expertise to figure out who might be causing that behavior that you're seeing, either by process or category. Like maybe your NFS um, disks are not responding correctly, and that's going to back up all kinds of stuff on your machine and cause problems. Um, but you have to figure out that it's the NFS subsystem that's causing problems. And by the way, there's some NFS file system uh, BCC tools as well. And this goes back, if I remember correctly, to RHEL 8. Was it included in 7? Were these features in 7? I don't think they were. So it was included as a tech preview in 7. Um, okay. Towards the end of, it's like 7.9, 7 I think, is where it came in. Maybe it was 7.8. But if you're looking for um, support remained, on them, though, 8 and 9. Yes, 8 mean. and 9. In fact, early versions of 8, it was still tech preview. It wasn't until like 8.3 or 8.4 that it became um, more fully supported. And yeah. So, but it's a great, uh, it's a great utility and, uh, or a set of utilities even for helping you figure out what's happening on your system. It's a great technology. How's that? There you go. So I wasn't paying attention to, uh, to chat. Did we get any questions that I didn't answer? Uh, let me look back. I think there was one that we didn't touch on, but I'm trying to find it here. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, I see that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this. Yeah. Kamaraju, Kamaraju uh, asked if BCC tool is talking directly to the kernel. What about SE Linux and firewall? Yep. And do you need special permissions? Uh, so, That's exactly the one I was thinking of. All, <laughs> yeah. So, all of that is hap uh, handled when you install the packages from RHEL. Um, it does not require any special permissions. Um, it uses a stack built into the kernel, like basically an API for interacting with this eBPF embedded kernel. So um, we handled the SE Linux contexts natively. Um, and you may have seen when we were installing some stuff, it actually, well, you probably didn't see it, but you may have seen when we were doing updates, there were some SE Linux uh, stuff that happened when you're installing updates. So it's common that an RPM will adjust things uh, for itself to be operational um, on right. a machine. We use the, the fact that it's talking right to the kernel. Sorry, I was going to say the fact that it's talking right to the kernel circumvents some of these things, right? So these are things you're going to have to think about. I don't think it circumvents SE Linux, but. Yeah, and and to be fair, we're not talking to the kernel. We're talking to the. The sub kernel. EVPF, kernel. Sandboxed kernel, right. Which kernel. is not making <laughs> changes to our running kernel. Right. It's just interacting and collecting data. So um, there's not a lot of security problems because it's not writing data into the kernel. It's just reading data out of the kernel. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about SE Linux. Oh, we use the targeted policy for SE Linux by default. Um, so that's what this machine is running. It's running in enforcing mode, targeting uh, targeted policy. If you're using like a really severe SE Linux mode, there may be more work you need to do to get it to work. Uh, but if you're taking the default targeted policy uh, from your Red Hat Enterprise Linux install, It'll work just by installing the RPMs. All right. The only other thing was uh, Conan was asking about why these things are not in bin or user bin, but I think we kind of touched on that at the beginning. Well, it's mostly like what we talked about last week where we don't necessarily want to put it somewhere where everyone on the system could find it. Um, right. So that's why I got put right. here. 
Yeah, it's it's um, not a it's not a commonly it's not a commonly used utility, so it doesn't really need to be in a commonly accessible place, right? The fact that they're off the beaten path is kind of a good thing because you don't accidentally run them. I don't know. Security by right. obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> not, well, it's not really security, but it's more, more like, like convenience by, not, by obscurity. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, all right, so I think that runs us off the end of our BCC Tools Linux performance talk, uh, which is, again, a departure from what we've been talking about, which is more general learning Linux utilities. So um, take it for what it is. Uh, good stuff, Nate. though. I mean, uh, like I said, I spent three years as a TAM. I never really dug into these, but they're so useful and so powerful. So check yeah. them out. If you, if you ever care about looking into performance, check them out. And the other, I uh, will, one more thing. Uh, they are read only, right? So they read data out of the kernel and then format it and show it to you. So you can play with them and not have to worry about like destroying your system because it's just right. like, taking data and showing you the read only. Data. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool stuff. All right. So Nate, next week, what are we doing? Next week, we're going to start working on applications, aren't we? What do we have in the coming up here? That's the rumor. Postfix. We're going to talk about setting up Postfix. I'm going to go way back to like all the scars I have internally from running mail servers and show you guys how to set up Postfix for maybe some simple use cases that might be helpful on RHEL. So uh, wish me luck and tune in next week. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to start looking at individual applications that one configures on top of Linux um, over the next few episodes. So Postfix will be the first and... I know that we have a list that we're going to go through. I don't know we've decided the order of the list yet. Right, right. Should be some good stuff, though. Uh, so we also have RHEL Present coming up in uh, not next week, but the week after, uh, which is a day in the life of the solutions architect. Um, so if you've been to, if you've worked at Red Hat or thought about working at Red Hat, uh, solution architecture is a way that a lot of technical contributors come into Red Hat. Um, and then we will also be talking about Podman Pods and Quadlet, which is a simpler way of defining um, Podman services. And at some point, Stratus is on the list too. So Stratus is a storage technology um, that is now general availability in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. Took it long enough. <laughs> well, so Conan Kudo is gonna gonna like not agree with me on this. Um, but I would say that people don't generally care about file system technology things. What they do care about, however, is when they put something in, they need to be come back later and get it back out again. What? Uh, and they get really cranky when that doesn't happen. So um so yeah, like the most important thing for storage technology isn't like the cool way it stores the file or whatever. It's when I put it there, can I come back and get it later? Um, and can I do so with almost zero chance of there being a mistake there? No, oh, and he yeah. doesn't disagree. Yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> it's even highlighted. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> All right. Uh, of so, course. He... <laughs> <laughs> so next week, we'll start working on services and we'll start with Nate taking us through some Postfix stuff. Yeah. Until next week. Should be fun. Happy Nolaturnling, everyone. Yep. Have a great have a great one, folks. <laughs>